Turn over to Matthew chapter 24. This is going to be a brief introduction message for the day of the Lord. I am going to, in future messages, have PowerPoint for you, but am not going to be able to do that today. Um, this morning, I didn't realize, hey, the Requintinas are back. God bless you guys. Um, this morning, I went through half of the Sunday school lesson. You didn't tell me there was nothing behind me. And my wife said, well, I was trying to get your attention, Jocelyn. I was waving at you back there. And I just wasn't paying attention myself, I guess. But it was really good stuff. You just missed, missed half of it. So anyway, we'll pick up with more of that next week and looking forward to, to that with you. Now, as we start on this subject of the day of the Lord, I've got to tell you that this is a very serious matter. This is not something that's easy to talk about. But the day of the Lord is is a uh, is a it really is a theme that runs through the entire Bible. It runs through the Old Testament passages of Scripture all the way through the New Testament passages of Scripture. The day of the Lord is quite evident ev evident all the way through it. It has a lot to do with Israel and the end times. That's for sure. You also understand that the day of the Lord is just exactly what it says. It is the day 
of the Lord. And it is a day that uh, is made up of and characteristic of two, two main elements. One element is judgment. Everybody say judgment. One element is judgment. You will find the day of the Lord has to do with God meeting out judgment upon a rebellious and wicked world. That day is still coming. And the Bible is very, very clear about that. I know that the world right now seems to think that things will go on and never change. If we as man, as human beings can change our world and we can make things better through climate change and all of that, or if we can make peace with all the nations and not cause any issues, then we could just go on and on and on forever. The problem with that is that's just not scriptural. It's not factual. It's not logical. It's just not going to happen that way. My Bible tells me that God is the one that created all things. Amen. He's the one that created it. He's the one that sustains it. And he is the one that's going to bring it to its ultimate end. And mankind, in his own ignorance, being willingly ignorant, Peter says, simply doesn't want to face the fact that there is an almighty God that's watching out for us and is the one that we are accountable to. That's what Paul was saying in Acts chapter 17 when he was talking to those people at Athens. There is a God that the times of your ignorance he has winked at, but now he commands everywhere, men everywhere to repent. And that's exactly what needs to happen, and that's what's going to happen. At the very end, we're going to find that God will one day bring all of this stuff to a final conclusion. The game will be over. You know, think about football right now. And I'm telling you, when you think when you're in a game where you just wish this game would be over, have you ever been played in a game like that, Jason? You've ever been in a game like that where it just seems like this game is never going to end? It just goes on and on and on. I, I suppose all of us have been in situations like that. We just felt like, man, I wish this work day was finally over. Well, understand this: the same thing is true when it comes to the world events right now. One day, all of this will finally be over. Our God will bring it to a climactic conclusion. He will judge the world in righteousness. There will be judgment. But the day of the Lord also has with it not just judgment. The day of the Lord also encompasses blessing. Now, that's one thing you have to keep in mind. It encompasses blessing as well. Most scholars agree that when you come to the day of the Lord, it does talk about this issue of the end times and include what you know normally as the tribulation. But then there's also that second coming of the Lord. There's also going into what's called the millennial reign. How many have heard of the millennial reign before? That time of God's blessing being poured up out, not on Israel, but the whole world. And so that millennial kingdom, that millennial reign is also included in the day of the Lord. These are, these are just summary points I'm just highlighting right now. We'll get into more of it later on. So there will be that judgment, but there will also be that time of blessing. The Bible is very clear about that. That is all the day of the Lord. That is different than the day of Christ. Now, you got to keep that in mind. The day of Christ is part of the day of the Lord, but different. Lord. It's that time when our Lord Jesus Christ comes back for his saints. When he comes back, we do find that there will be a gathering of all of those believers together. That's the day of Christ. I explain to you as we go along. Most of you uh, have been taught one particular way your life. Day of the Lord, the day of Christ, the rapture, and all of that there. And I understand that. We all have our backgrounds. We all have our belief system. I want you to the scriptures in the next few months. Okay, Today is just a simple introductory message about uh, what, what is coming. Okay, So this, this afternoon, you just one question. Are you getting ready? Are you getting ready for the day of the Lord? Are you getting ready for the day of Christ? Are you getting ready for when Jesus Christ is coming back? Are you ready for that? Are you getting ready for that? Let me show you some scriptures. You're in Matthew chapter 24. First of all, just tell us. Ready. Matthew 4, verse 42. The Bible says, Watch therefore for you know the Lord doth The uh, seasons, he says, you don't know. 
Come, keep on reading. But know that come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. He goes on, therefore be ye also ready. Are you ready? For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. So one thing is very clear from this passage of Scripture, and that's simply this. He says, be ye ready for the coming of the Lord. You're waving at me. Now, I don't have anything back there now. My microphone. No battery. It's not coming on. Oh, there we go. Did it come on? Ah, hear me? Perfect. Just wave at me. Throw something at me. All right, so be ye also ready, he says. Make sure you are ready, because in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. And beloved, that are to put you on a, a time frame or at least an expectancy, an er, the, the, uh, the feeling of expectancy, knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ is on schedule to come back. We do not know when. We know we're getting close. And I believe that there are things that we can still look for to see the timing of His coming. But he basically says, in your spirit, you should be living your life in such a way that you are ready. He's not saying that necessarily that, uh, that uh, you know, you blink your eyes and Jesus is coming right now. That may be so. I don't know about all of that. But I will tell you this. He's telling you you should live your life in such a way that any time uh, you, you should be thinking to yourself is, I'm going to live my life in urgency knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ is on schedule to come, be coming back when he's ready to come back. So be ready. Let me show you another passage of Scripture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Turn over there. we got several to look at this evening. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Watch and be sober. Turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 5. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Now, it's obvious. We've been a long ways from these verses, haven't it? It's been 2,000 years plus since these verses were written. And even there, Paul says you should have an expectancy about your life. All he's saying is this. When you have, when you, you have an attitude of life, right? Have an attitude of life, an attitude of urgency about your life. That's all he's saying is. That whenever you're living your life for the Lord Jesus Christ, do not be complacent. Do not be lethargic. Make sure that you're living your life on the edge of your seat. Thinking always, I want to serve my Lord. I want to be faithful to my Lord. I want to be a faithful and good disciple for Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. Be ready for that because that is the urgency that he wants us to have. Now, you're in uh, the New Testament. Go to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 4. This is, again, all preliminary things as we just get into these things this fall. Verse 1, I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Look at verse 5. But watch thou, you, watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. You know, one thing that I was meditating upon this week is I was thinking about not only this passage of Scripture and my life as a pastor. You know, the Bible tells me as a pastor that I am to be very careful. I am to be watching. And that what he says? He says, make sure that you are watching. And then he says, endure afflictions. Be ready to endure the persecutions that are coming. But then he says, do the work of an evangelist. He is telling if, if Timothy this, this young pastor, as a qualification, basically saying, do the work of an evangelist. You know, I got to remember this. Now, guys, those of you that are going in the ministry or those that want to be ministers of some sort, listen to me. Would you listen? I, it's amazing to me the generation that's now coming through that simply do not have the mind of evangelism. I mean, I, I've talked with people. They don't mind teaching. They would love to preach or be the guy behind the pulpit. But the one that's out going door to door and winning people to Jesus Christ, they don't want to be that guy. And it's an amazing thought to me that that's exactly what we are supposed to be as ministers of the gospel. If you're going to be a pastor, if you're going to be one that's going to uh, oversee or be an overseer of a church, you should be one also who is winning people to Jesus Christ. It should be what's always on your mind. 
you know, the burden that I carry, and I, and I told Debbie this, uh, this, this week, I have such a burden that I carry constantly uh, for the church and teaching and preaching and sharing and discipling and correcting and all the stuff that pastors do. But you know what else is on my mind? Winning people to the Lord all the time. I, I was at a birthday party over uh, for, for uh, uh, what, what's the kid's name? Emily, my daughter, Emily. And her birthday was, uh, yes, I know who she is. And uh, she turned 16. And we had a birthday party over at the Autry's. They said, hey, you could use our pool. So we had a little pool party for her for her 16th birthday. While I was there, I kept thinking to myself, we're having a great time. The party was kind of quieting down. But all that was on my mind is I've got to get the hospital, got to get to the hospital to present the gospel to Kevin Brown. I want to make sure he's saved. I got to make sure he's saved. We prayed for him on Wednesday night. Remember that? We prayed for him on Wednesday night. And I kept thinking he's going to die. He's going to die before I can go by and talk to him. And it was on my heart. There's a constant pressure uh, to get over there and do that. Where does that come from? I believe that comes from the Lord. And as those of you that are wanting to go into ministry, do you have that burden? I got to tell this person about Jesus Christ. I have to do the work of an evangelist. That's part of what we do as pastors. So get that in your mind. I'm not saying that you got to go out every single day or even every single weekend. But I'm saying this ought to be on your mind constantly, and you should be trying to win people to Jesus Christ. That's part of being ready. So you know that Jesus Christ is coming. We know the day of the Lord is going to approach us. It's coming very, very soon. But as that comes, listen, what are we doing? We, we are supposed to be making sure that we keep the faith. We're making full proof of our ministry, but also we're doing the work of evangelists, trying to win people to Jesus Christ. We're just about out of time. Can I get an amen on that? We're just about out of time. I didn't get much of an amen on that. Amen. Amen. And uh, to, to, to uh, make sure we're winning people to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's chapter 4, verse 1, verse 5. Now look at verse 8. Paul says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. There's that day. And not to me only, but to all them also that love is appearing. You're looking forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're being faithful as a disciple, and you're ready uh, to go when he comes. Okay? So this admonition to be ready is very, very clear. But then also, number two, quickly, there is a warning of coming persecution. Warning of coming persecution. Now go back to Matthew chapter 24. See, one thing that you got to realize too is that the coming of the day of the Lord, yes, it is coming. We know it's on schedule. Jesus Christ is going to come. He's going to gather his believers together. We understand all of that, but never in the scriptures. Now get this, never, 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 never in the scriptures are you told that Christians will not be persecuted. Never in the scriptures are you ever told that somehow, some way, Christians will be delivered from coming persecution. It's never in the scriptures. Matter of fact, it's just the opposite. But yet we are told so often, well, the Lord Jesus is Christ. If he's going to come, he's going to take us away before persecution comes. That's just not true. Matter of fact, the Bible is just the opposite of that. He says that you must enter in the kingdom of God through much tribulation, through much persecution. Those that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. First and second Peter are all about that. So when you study the scriptures, you find that the scriptures are very, very clear that Christians, we are basically earmarked for persecution, like a lamb to the slaughter. So will we be persecuted. If your master was persecuted, the disciple would be persecuted. So get it in your mind right now that persecution is going to be coming your way. Unless you die. Unless you die before uh, all this happens, persecution is coming your way. Okay, I can say that with the authority of scriptures. Okay, uh, Understand that. So before, as we see the day of the Lord approaching, and as the day of the Lord comes, understand this. There is coming persecution for you and for me. Now, I understand that that's not what you want to hear. I remember the story of Corey Ten Boom, who went over to China uh, after World War II. And, of course, she had gone through all of the, the issues of, of persecution and the Nazis and all that kind of stuff. And she went to China even afterwards, and she talked, about, talked to the persecuted church while she was there. And those in China had to deal with communism. And she was dealing with talking with these individuals that had gone through tremendous persecution in China where the pastors were being persecuted and killed. People were being uh, put in jail and persecuted for their faith. And many of those young Christians that were over in China were told so many times, don't worry, Jesus is going to come and deliver you from all of this. 
Well, guess what? The communists came in and they persecuted them, put them in jail, killed them, tortured them. Many of them lost their faith. They were looking for Jesus to come, but Jesus never came because they kept being told that from Western missionaries over and over and over. And finally, she got over there and she realized how many people lost their faith, how many people turned from the faith, how many people fell away. And yet she said to them, that's not what the scriptures teach. And she's exactly right. The scriptures teach no persecution is coming. So rather than tell you as my church, hey, don't worry about a thing. Jesus Christ coming again. Amen. Woohoo! I'd rather tell you, get ready. It's coming. Persecution. Now, Jesus Christ takes us all away. Woohoo! Hey, man, I'm excited about that. But until he does, you be ready for persecution. I showed you a picture this morning about those Christians that were hanging. Did you see that? You didn't see that one, did you? Man, you missed all the good stuff. Not good stuff, but you missed all the cool pictures. Well, that was a picture that was showing um, the Christians that were being hung by Sharia law. Okay, it's happening right now. And if that's happening there, can it not happen here? It could. So we know that persecution is coming. Let me show you that what the Bible says about that. Matthew chapter 24, look at verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us what shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and the end of the world. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take ye heed that no man deceive you. Now jump down to verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. Now he's talking to his disciples. And I understand that some people think, well, he's talking to the Jewish people here. No, he's not. Matter of fact, he's already rejected the Jewish nation earlier and said, I will now go away from the Jewish nation. He's talking to his own disciples here. They will kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. He goes on, look at verse 12. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. There's going to come a time when you will be persecuted and you will be delivered even he says to the synagogues if he's talking to the jewish nation why is he saying the synagogues are going to persecute the jewish nation no he's talking about christian people he's talking about disciples here you will be the ones that are going to be persecuted and of course it was paul the apostle was one of the first people that were being persecuted by the jewish people all throughout his journeys so we know persecution is coming look at second thessalonians chapter one. Second thessalonians chapter one paul writing again two of the Books that are most prominent dealing with the end times are First and Second Thessalonians. And Paul is writing about the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. And that's what these books are all about. First Thessalonians chapter 3, look at verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. So he says that Jesus Christ is coming, but listen, make sure that you are abounding, strong, unblameable in holiness before the Lord. All of these things are still coming. Now you're in First, uh, first Thessalonians. Go to Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Look at verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in the churches of God for your patience and faith. Now look, in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, they are already going through difficulty, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. Your persecution is a token of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with a God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance of them that know not God." and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all of them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. 
very clearly, he says, persecution's coming. And as you are being persecuted, the end is that Jesus Christ is coming. And we will all will admire him when he comes. But while he does, the persecution that you are going through is an evident token of the righteous judgment of God to show that you are worthy to enter into that kingdom. What he's saying is the persecution that you face as a Christian, as you face it, as you suffer that persecution, you do it under impatience, trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. He is coming. That is an evident token for you, showing you that the quality of your faith is a beautiful thing. The scriptures are very clear about that. The warning of coming persecution is very clear. One more passage. Look at James chapter 5. Almost done. James chapter 5. One of the most difficult challenges to preach on Sunday afternoon. Keep everybody awake. I get it. James chapter 5. It's really bad when I fall asleep while I'm preaching. That's the worst part. James chapter 5 and verse 7. But he says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, when under the coming of the Lord... Behold, the husband waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until it received the earth at the early and latter rain. Be also patient, establish your heart for the coming of the Lord is drawing nigh. And so again, being ready, being, being waiting for that. Keep going. Verse 9. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Then he goes on in context. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord. For an example of suffering affliction and of patience. See, we're told, yeah, be patient. Be patient till the coming of the Lord comes. Well, that's fine, but notice the context. Take my prophets as an example of what? Waiting patiently in persecution. Verse 11, behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job. have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. See, understanding when you talk about the day of the Lord and the day of Christ and all of that, we are to be ready, urgently serving the Lord, but also understanding that we are appointed to persecution. We are appointed to suffer. We are appointed to lose our job for our testimony. We're appointed to, to, to lose uh, our physical body and, and, and persecution and, and uh, being uh, scourged and being tried and being chastised, uh, being mocked and being spat upon. Just like our Lord Jesus, he says, if it happened to me as your, as your master, surely it will happen as a disciple as well. All these things are appointed unto us. Turn over to another one, 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter 4. Look at verse 16. If, I get any, if you get anything out of this introductory message, just understand this, that you and I as Christians, although we can rejoice and live in this world in a wonderful way, the persecutions are coming. We need to be ready for that. 1 Peter chapter 4, look at verse 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Have you ever wondered what that verse means? I've heard all kinds of crazy messages about what that means, but really it simply means this judgment must begin at the house of God. What he means is there is coming a time in the church of God itself when judgment will begin. There will be persecution. There will be a time of judgment, not from necessarily God himself, but a proving time, I think is what he means by that. There will be persecution. Are you truly a born again believer or are you not? Are you a professor or are you a possessor of the Lord Jesus Christ? And the judgment will begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? What he's saying is this, God simply has appointed his church that there's going to come a time of testing. There's going to come a time of proving, a time of judgment in that sense, to be able to see what are you made out of. And then from there, what about the end of the world? Boy, he says, even this point, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Verse 18, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Meaning again, you are going to go through that difficulty. Look at verse 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God. Isn't it interesting? Is it ever the will of God that you suffer? Well, that's what it says. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God. How many charismatic churches or how many name it and claim it and prosperity gospel preachers say it's never right for you to be sick? 
It's never right for you to be poor. You need to give your money and I'll, the Lord will bless you this and the Lord will bless you that. And you're to have a five carat ring and drive around in a Ferrari and all this stuff that they claim. Oh, it's never right. You should never be in the will of God to suffer. Never in the will of God to be, be unhealthy. But what does the Bible say? If you suffer according to the will of God, it is the will of God for you to suffer sometimes. And especially at these end times, commit the keeping of the souls to him in well-doing as under a faithful creator. So all of that simply to say, persecution is coming. So be ready. Persecution is coming. And then lastly, Get your soul ready. Get your soul ready. Go back to Luke chapter 21. And this is the thing. When I first started understanding the scriptures that as a Christian, I'm going to have to go through persecution at some time, it really woke me up. It really helped me understand that I have got to be ready for that. I can't just go in my life thinking, well, everything is going to be a wonderful day, happy day for me, no persecution. No, I've got to get ready for that. I've got to train for that is what I've got to have in my life. You know, uh, how many have heard of, you know, uh, preseason football? You know what I'm talking about? Preseason football? Preseason football is that time when you are, you got this huge roster and you're trying to get everybody cut down to the certain number that you're supposed to have on a roster. It's also to do that extra training. You got the, the, the new plays you're trying to work on and so forth because you know that game day is coming. And then you've got a, you only got a certain amount of games to be able to prove yourself. And at the end of the game, maybe you might be in the Super Bowl, right, at the end of the season. So when it comes to football or anything like that, you know that there's going to come a time when there's going to be the testing. The time is going to be the, the, the quality testing of who you are and what you're made out of. And that's going to come. So what do you do as a football player? Well, you train. You get, you get stronger and you get faster and you get your nutrition. Maybe you're a marathon runner or you got something else that you're doing. I was talking to Keith and Rachel this morning. They got races coming up and Rachel's running a half marathon in October. And so she's been trying to run and trying to bike and get herself all ready for that. Why? Why not just go to the half marathon without doing anything? Pizza in one hand and a milkshake in the other. And just show, JB says, amen. You just show up. I'm going to do a half marathon, man. Anybody know how far a half marathon is? 13.1. You ever seen those little stickers on the back of a car? It says 26.2, 13.1, 5. You ever seen those on the back? I used to wonder, what is that? I mean, for two, five, two three years, I would think, what is that? And then finally, someone says, well, 26.2, that's a marathon. They ran a marathon. 13.1, they have a half marathon. And then you got a 5K and so forth. It was so funny the other day. I saw one on the back. It says 0.0. <laughs> I said, you go, buddy, you go. Uh, that's a JB car right there. But why not just show up with a milkshake in one hand, a pizza a pie in the other? Because you know if you're going to do anything, you're gonna have to, you have to sh get in shape for that. And so here's the thing that really struck home with me is, okay, well, Lord, I, I don't understand it. You're my God, and you're my creator, and if you said that is what is coming, I, I'm not going to question that, amen? So I just need to get ready. And he said he would be with me. He would give me the answers that I need to give when I'm standing before a trial or whatever. He says, I'll give you the words. Say, all of it, he's provided all of that, but he says, just be willing to die. Be willing to die. That's it. And so to get ready to be willing to die, that's the thing. How do you get yourself where you're prepared to die? You got to get your soul ready. So listen to some of these passages of scriptures. Luke chapter 21, look at verse 34. And we'll be finish up with these next few verses. Luke 21, 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your heart be overcharged with surfeiting, drunkenness, cares of this life so that day come upon you unaware see how do i prepare myself he says listen take heed to yourself understand what you're doing what am i spending time doing what, what have i allowed to come into my mind or to consume my thoughts remember this morning we talked about living in the world with a clear conscience by the grace of god 
the relevancy that I want to have with the world around me is I want to have a clear conscience. And when I find myself battling an unclear conscience because of something I saw or something I'm thinking or a feeling that I am entertaining, a bitterness or an anger or a worry or an anxiety, then I realize, wait a second, I'm off focus here. And I've got to get my mind back on the Lord. Getting too concerned about worldly things. Who's playing in the next game or what's going on here or, oh, I've got to do this or I've got to do that. I understand a lot of that's very practical things for you. But when it, you become consumed with that, listen to what he says. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your heart be overcharged with serviting, drunkenness, cares of this life so that that day come upon you unawares. Make sure, for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always. See, the idea is I want to make sure that I am ready. I am prepared for that to come. That is what I must do with my soul. And then also 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. A couple more. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. I realize how important this subject is, so I'm trying to give you all the scriptures that I can give to you to reveal to you the mind of the Lord on this issue and not the mind of man. 1 Thessalonians 3, look at verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do to you, to the end he may establish your heart unblameable in holiness before God even our Father, when at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, again, I want to make sure that I am prepared, unblameable in holiness, that simplicity and godly sincerity we talked about this morning. Innocency and simplicity, godly sincerity before my Lord, not with fleshly wisdom, see, but spiritual discernment. That's what I'm trying to prepare myself for, my family for. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you're still in Thessalonians, look at verse 23. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to keep yourself pure and blameless before the Lord. And then we'll just look at 2 Peter and we'll be done. 2 Peter chapter 3. There's a few verses here. Verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Look at verse 14, wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Verse 17, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace. See, it's all about that. See, we know that we're supposed to be ready. We're supposed to be expecting persecution to come. And if it doesn't, praise God for that. But I'm expecting it to come. I'm expecting one day for someone to walk through that door and put me in handcuffs and take me out of here. I, I expect that. I, I think about it every day. Um, I think about maybe coming to my house and someone just taking me off to jail because of my stand for the Lord, just for being a pastor or a message I heard, a message I preached and they heard it on YouTube because we have a YouTube channel or, or something else going on and then just coming and get me and taking me. I, I fully expect something like that. I'm ready for that. I, I'm fully expecting to have it. And so therefore, I try to live my life thinking that that could come at any time. See, and the Lord Jesus Christ knows my heart. If he comes before that, wonderful. If I die before that, wonderful. But if I have to go through that persecution, I know that he will be with me. That's the mindset I want you to have. If you don't have that right now, you need to get that. You need to get that mindset that you're living your life as a disciple and as such. You will walk in the footsteps of Jesus. That means persecution is going to be coming your way. So just get ready for that. And then when it comes, you won't lose your faith. Ah. I didn't know this was supposed to happen. I didn't know Jesus was supposed to come and take me away from it. No, no, no. He never said that. He never said that. So be ready for the persecution. When it comes, you'll be strong. You'll be a testimony for him until he does come back. Okay. 
The day of the Lord then, the Bible is very clear also, that that day of the Lord is that time frame that will include this persecution involved in as well. And so there will be a time frame of persecution that the church will be having to go through, that's for sure, until he comes and gathers his own all together. Okay? We'll talk more about that next week. And I will have PowerPoint, and hopefully it will work. And uh, we'll do that next week. Okay? Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your grace to us, allowing us to be together this this afternoon. And Lord, we thank you that you have given us scripture that indicate to us that the end of all things is at hand. We know that time is coming when you are on schedule, Father, you will be coming back in your day. And you've told us that in these last days that we are to be ready, we are to be faithful, and we are to expect persecution, for we are appointed thereunto. And so, Lord, help us prepare our souls for that, to know that we are going to be the off-scurrying of the world. We, like Jesus, will be mocked and we will go through difficulty. But, Lord, help us to have patience. Help us to be uh, godly. Help us to have the grace that we need in our life to serve you faithfully until the very end. And, Lord, we know that you'll give us the grace to do that. We love you, Lord. Bless us now and be with all those that are leaving town and traveling. Watch over them. Keep them safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes. We are done. Hey, you know what a good thing about that? He didn't go to sleep. He just says, at least he didn't say it's about time. <laughs>